Good morning, and thank you for joining us this morning for our eFields 2019 results webinar. To start off with a little bit of housekeeping, there will be some polls that pop up throughout the webinar today. Feel free to respond if you're interested. And there is, towards the bottom of your screen, an option to submit questions. It's labeled as Q&A. So please take advantage of that, and we will take all questions at the end of this webinar. So to start off with, I'd like to give a quick overview of the eFields program. The eFields program is an on-farm research network that was started at Ohio State University with results first being published in 2017. Um, this was an effort to really work to increase the consistency and the reach of the work that we've been doing at Ohio State for some time now. So the three key goals we outlined were to conduct on-farm research that helps unite the public and private sectors to drive innovation that benefits farmers, especially in Ohio. And then to do that, we're partnering with farmers to do on-farm research to test innovative practices in real production agriculture settings. And I think one of the key parts to this mission is really delivering that information to you as farmers in a timely way so that you can use it to improve your operations from year to year. So I wanna go over some of the things that we're doing here at Ohio State today to achieve those three goals. And the first is our partnership with industry. We're very excited to be able to say that we have many companies working with us today through this program whether that be through in-kind donations of seed or equipment that we're using and testing on farm. So I wanna definitely take a moment to extend our sincerest gratitude to these companies, the ones that worked with us in 2019 that you can see here, as, long, as well as our partners from past years as well. Our partnership with farmers really is the linchpin in this whole effort. We have standardized protocols that can be repeated across the state, and these protocols are developed by working with both farmers and our extension researchers at the university. This ensures that we're asking questions that are relevant to you and your local interests, but also that we have a scientific rigor behind the trials and the results that we're publishing. And then right now, the eFields report is one of our primary ways that we are communicating the results from these trials back to you. So these reports are released in early January each year and it highlights all of the on-farm field scale research that's being conducted across Ohio. When you flip through the report, you can find information about where in the state the trial was conducted, as well as additional information about the management practices on the farms where these trials were conducted. There's also some statistical analysis with each trial, and this helps give you the confidence these results are going to be repeatable on your farm in the future, or you can understand whether or not yeah, that's a possibility. Currently, we've identified six focus areas that we focus on in the eFields program. And a lot of these are technology or precision ag focused. So precision seeding, the seeding rate trials have been some of our most popular trials over the three years. Nutrient management is a major concern in Ohio, especially as it relates to water quality and then precision crop management as well. You'll also find results about soil compaction and mitigating it, using remote sensing in our decision-making process, and then some general data analysis and management trials, research that we're doing to help you better use, utilize data you're collecting on your farm. So one thing that sets this apart is most of our trials are standardized from protocols. And these are all field scale trials conducted with farmer equipment or equipment similar to what you would see on your farm. Our trials are mostly randomized and replicated. And so if you look at this example here on the right of a plot layout, you can see that there are four different replications in this seeding rate trial and each of those are color coded. Within each of those four replications, we're testing five different corn seeding rates. And you can see that they're randomized and in a different order in each of these replications. So this approach to laying out a trial allows us to, in many cases, overcome the field variability that we might see in a field scale trial and put statistics to these trials to understand whether or not these results that we're seeing are a result of the treatment that we're testing or just random field variability. 
If you're curious to check out the protocols that we have currently available, you can find those on our website. One of the things that we're most proud of with the eFields program is the growth that we've seen since we set out in 2017. One of our goals is to bring local results to growers across Ohio. And you can see the progression over the three years that the number of counties that we're covering and conducting research trials in has grown each year. We also have more trials. We have more partner farmers involved. Our industry partnership has grown as well. And you can see that there's a lot of interest with OSU contributors to helping bring the research that they've been doing in labs and on research farms to farms across Ohio to better translate that research. So next we're gonna go through and highlight some of the results from the 2019 trials. To start off with, we've got Dr. Aaron Wilson. He's our extension climatologist at Ohio State and he's going to give us a 2019 weather review and then an outlook for 2020. Greetings, everyone. My name is Aaron Wilson, and I'm an atmospheric research scientist at OSU and a climate specialist with OSU Extension. Uh, my role with eFields is really to provide weather and climate overview each season. Today, we will focus a little bit on 2019, but I want to spend a majority of today's uh, talk looking ahead at the 2020 season. So as a 2019 overview, the, on the left-hand side, you see a figure showing our departure from average temperatures. Uh, it was warmer than average here in Ohio, transitioning to, toward cooler than average conditions across the upper Midwest. Uh, the middle figure shows our percent of normal precipitation. We all know how wet it was in 2019, especially the first six months here in Ohio. Uh, and even with our drought during the autumn of 2019, uh, it was really well above average for, for the year. So we can see most of the precipitation here in Ohio, we were running anywhere from uh, slightly above average to up to 150% of our normal. On the right-hand side, you see state rankings. These are for annual numbers. Uh, and, and 2019 ranked as the sixth wettest on record for Ohio, indicated by the bottom right figure. You can also see throughout much of the Midwest and, and certainly the northern tier of, of states, these were the wettest years on record indicated by the 125. So what does 2020 have in store for us? Well, we're going to start that by looking at this past winter. Uh, again, departure from average temperatures on the left hand side, you can see the conditions have been quite warm across all of the Midwest this winter. Here in Ohio, we've been running anywhere from two to eight degrees above average. Uh, for the winter period. Again, the middle figure is showing our percent of normal precipitation here in Ohio and all across the Eastern Corn Belt region. Uh, precipitation has been above average, indicated by those green shadings, as much as 175% of average over the December, January, and February period. A little bit drier conditions have been centered out in Iowa and parts of Western Illinois. Now, again, the rankings on the right-hand side show that for Ohio, this past winter was the fifth warmest winter on record and 22nd wettest on record. So as a whole, our conditions here in Ohio continue to be uh, warmer and wetter than average. Of course, now that we're well into March, we do pay close attention to our soils and our streams. Uh, both are, are quite wet. As a matter of fact, if you look at the calculated soil moisture on the left-hand side, again, we're starting off a planting season again with tremendously wet soils across much of the country. Uh, here in Ohio, soils are a little bit drier this year at this time this year than last year, uh, but by no means are we dry. And we can really see that both in terms of the soil moisture, but also the stream flows on the right hand side. So all the green dots, light blue and dark blue dots here close to Ohio and Indiana, these are conditions anywhere from average to much above normal in terms of stream flows. So water is running, soils are wet, and that's how we're, we're really kicking off this season. Now, even more recently, the 30-day precipitation values uh, on the left-hand side show that from Ohio back through southern Indiana, uh, rainfall has been really significant. Red shadings indicating over five inches of rain during the last 30 days. A few locations, especially here in central Ohio, we've seen upwards of 10 inches of rain in the last 30 days. Uh, so we've seen a lot of bridges washed out. Uh, we've seen very high or record high river flows. Uh, on some of our rivers. So this is well above average, uh, twice or more above average as we can see on the bottom right hand figure. And again, accompanied by temperatures that are running anywhere from two to six degrees above average over this last 30 days. Now in the very short term, 
uh, our wet conditions do not look to subside this week. So for the period between March 24th, yesterday, through the end of the month, our, our models are, are indicating upwards of three inches of rainfall, uh, anywhere from really two to three inches of rainfall across Ohio and back through the Eastern Corn Belt region. So if this does come to fruition, certainly this is not the best news uh, as we're really wanting to get out in our fields as conditions are really already soggy. So I would anticipate some aerial flooding and certainly some standing water over the next several days uh, to continue. Now there may be a little bit of a break for us in the offing. The latest Climate Prediction Center outlook, six to 10 day outlook indicates slightly elevated probability of above average temperatures here in Ohio, a little bit higher back toward the Dakotas and Nebraska. As far as precipitation goes, we have a slightly elevated probability of drier than average conditions. So that will certainly be a welcome break for us as we head into the first couple days of April. Extending that now from the end of May through maybe the first week of April, indications now are again for warmer than average conditions uh, and, and slightly elevated probability of drier than average conditions for that first week as well. So once we get through this week, we look at next week, we can have a little bit of a break in the near term. Looking at the latest April outlook from the Climate Prediction Center, again, elevated probability of above average temperatures, as you see on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, equal chance of above, below, or near normal rainfall here in the state. Uh, but it's not very far off that we see these elevated probabilities of, of wetter than average conditions. Um, so I, I would lend, you know, kind of a normal April to maybe slightly wetter than average April uh, as we head through the month. And finally, looking at our April through June outlook, it's not the best news for us here in Ohio in the Eastern Corn Belt region. We're certainly looking at above average uh, precipitation, elevated probabilities of above average precipitation here. So wet conditions continue, but hopefully with some warmer weather, which is likely a uh, warmer than average weather that is that is likely uh, we can get some drying done as well. Not every year is the same. So 2020 will not be uh, exactly like 2019, but I do expect some of us to face some similar challenges. Uh, and, and so I know, uh, you know, we just got to be ready to, to, to get our work done uh, to get out there when we possibly can. So that's really kind of the advice from the weather side of things. Finally, the, the latest NOAA outlook on the spring flood outlook here looks at minor risk across the Ohio Valley. As we get back into the Mississippi and the Missouri basins, those categories go up to moderate and major risk for spring flooding there. So it does look like 2020 will be similar to 2019. Again, not the same, but we've got some similar challenges on hand. Anytime throughout the growing season, you would like some more information, I provide a five to 10 minute video update. You can find that at the State Climate Office of Ohio's website, climate.osu.edu. Just click on the hydrologic and climate assessment. Finally, good luck this season and thank you for your time. Thank you, Aaron. Our next speaker today is Chris Soler. He is the extension educator in Tuscaroras County and he's going to share some statewide results as well as some local results of the soybean and corn seeding rate trials. Hello, this is Chris Soller, I'm an extension educator in Tuscarawas County for Agriculture and Natural Resources with Ohio State University Extension. And I want to talk to you briefly about uh, kind of a summary of the bean fields research in Ohio and in my county and specifically looking at soybeans and corn seeding rate studies. The slide that you see here is the statewide results for the soybean seeding rates uh, between 2017, the first year for the project in 2019. So over the three years, there were 40 sites. Uh, seeding rates ranged from a low of 50,000 to a high of 240,000. And you can see the average stands, uh, stand rates for each of those years, 2017 was 87, 83%, and 76%. And then we have uh, a range which went on the low end from 50% up to 98%. So that's a soybean statewide seeding rate study. Uh, looking at 2019 specifically, the slide shows across the bottom is the target seeding rate in 1,000 seeds per acre and then relative yield. The red, solid red line that you see across the top uh, is at 90%. So the majority of those studies fell uh, above or, or above that 90% in terms of relative yield. And just one site had uh, anything below that 90% and that was the lower emerging site for that year. So again, if we look across the board from, from the uh, 70 something to almost about 240,000, 
everything was above that 90% relative yield. And this just summarizes over the three years, the numbers of treatments each year and the percent that fell below 90% and 95%. And so we had uh, the first year, 51 treatments, uh, two were below 90%, 11 below 95%. In 2018, 90 treatments, six below 90 and 13 below 95. And then this past year, 122 treatments. And you can see the percentages or the numbers that fell below those percentages. So overall, very positive. This is interesting. This is a uh, soybean seeding rate economics calculator looking at various seeding rates from the low of 80,000 to a high of 240,000. We hold our seed rate, our seed cost constant, uh, and our yields are constant across there. And so if we look at those different seeding rates, given those numbers, uh, the very bottom there shows return above seed cost. You can see what those numbers look like. And the interesting thing is if we um, move that from 160,000 to 120,000 seeds per acre, we can see that uh, that 40,000 seed difference, we actually have a higher return above seed cost, uh, as it's highlighted here with that, that oval. And so if we look at all the soybean acres in Ohio, if we reduce those by 40,000 from 160 to 120, uh, we look at a seeding, savings per acre of $17.12, we multiply that by just over 5 million acres of soybeans in Ohio, that amounts to $87 million that we're putting back and keeping in folks' pockets. So looking specifically at uh, the Tuscarawas County seeding rates for soybeans, and I'll run through these a little quickly. Uh, this is 2017, we looked at 80,000 at the low end, 160 at the high end, and in, in our particular study, 100,000 seeds per acre had the highest yield. In 2018 and 19, we looked at not only the yield, but also the return above seed cost. And so in 2018, we had uh, relatively virtually unchanged yields, but 100,000 was the highest yielding and the highest return above seed cost. And in 2019, uh, 80,000 was actually our highest uh, return above seed cost, not the highest yielding. Uh, one bushel per acre more was the difference, but overall, those lower seed rates did very, very well. Uh, corn seeding rates, looking at statewide results, we had in a three-year period, had 28 sites across the state, ranged from a low of 22,000 seeds per acre to a high of 44,000 seeds per acre, and really good stand averages over those three years, 92 to 96 uh, percent. These slide, next slides look at, you can see on the right-hand side, all the different counties that were involved. We don't really see that um, there's a distinct a line as we do with soybeans with these corn seed rates, but it gives you an idea that most of these studies were 90% or better above. Looking specifically in, in our county, we had, uh, this is the first year in 2017, looked at different seeding rates, a low of 22,000 to a high of 38,000. And so somewhere in that 30 to 34,000 was our highest yielding. And then in 18 and 19, we added in uh, not only yield, but return above seed cost. And so the population in 2018 at 34,000 was the highest uh, return above seed cost, not quite the highest yielding, but the highest return above seed cost. And then in 2019, it was actually the highest yielding uh, at 36,000 and the highest return above seed cost. And then I had a farmer contact me who, it's a dairy farm, it was uh, planting 30 inch rows and a uh, year or so decided to plant, uh, just kind of experiment with 15 inch rows and so doubling back and planting those 15 inch rows. And he heard about the E-Fields project and wanted to see if this could be a part of it. So we developed a, a layout here where we had 15 inch rows and 30 inch rows at varying seeding rates. And in this case, our 15 inch rows are what we call our higher seeding rate, highest seeding rate, uh, was the best yielding at 229 bushels per acre. And he plans to do that again this year with another plot that will be participating in the program. Uh, just a little quick thank you to our cooperating farms in the county, Carlin Farms, Durban Farms, and Spillman Farms. Thank you, Chris, for sharing that with us today. Next up, we've got Sam Custer, Extension Educator in Dart County, and he's going to share the results of his manure side dress trials. This is Sam Custer. Extension Educator, Dart County, and I am going to visit with you a little bit about our manure side dress trials that we held here in Dart County in 2019. 
So the objective of our work is to continue to evaluate that effectiveness of swine manure versus commercial fertilizer on both an economic and environmental perspective. We've been doing this for several years now and we continue to fine tune some of the work we're doing with that. So in our trials, we have uh, three replications where we are uh, leaving strips uh, untreated with the swine manure. We come back in that same day or the next day and do an application of typically UANA, UAN 28% uh, at the same nitrogen level. So we balance those treatments uh, using the nitrogen. The treatments are typically done at V3 growth stage. That's where we were in 2019. In 2018, we were a strong V4, if, if not the V5 stage. This work all came about from some tanker research that we started here in Dart County back in 2013. Uh, you can see some of the work here, and I'll just play a little bit of the video uh, as we go here. Turn the volume off. So we began doing this work uh, with tankers just to see what we could do with this uh, manure application versus uh, commercial fertilizer at side dress. So you can see us moving through the field here at this V2, V3 corn uh, with the tankers. So we know we have a tremendous amount of compaction. So at no time were we looking at this as being a sole practice that we would do across uh, farms uh, with manure application. It was just to see if, if we could get that same kind of yield out of this. And, and even though we had uh, a tremendous amount of compaction, our yields were very comparable, and they backed up the data that Glenn Arnold, nutrient management specialist, uh, found at um, the OARDC branches up in, in Northwest. So in a five-year period of time, you can see that uh, when Glenn did these treatments pre-emergent and post-emergent, the yield difference between incorporated and uh, UAN incorporates fine manure, about uh, 16 to 19 bushels difference uh, during that time period. When we look at the application between a surface applied and a uh, incorporated, you can see almost a 26, 27 bushel difference. So from these trials, we know that uh, the swine manure will work, uh, especially if we incorporate it. A, a tremendous difference uh, with that incorporation. So in 2014, here in Dark County, for the first time anywhere in the world, we believe, we did these uh, side dress applications using a drag line hose uh, to directly incorporate the manure and you can see as we move through here, this was V3 corn um, in northwestern part of Dart County. Uh, we we're moving along here at this time, uh, probably four or five miles an hour, a little faster than what they would like to do, but uh, they were using a guidance system. This was uh, an eight row unit at this point in time. Today we've moved to a, a 12 row unit, but you can see uh, we're using this. Our goal is to, to cover up uh, that manure. Uh, as you can see, we got a pretty good cover up here at an application of about 6,000 gallons per acre. So how did our trials turn out in 2019? We had uh, two different farmers that we worked with. So you can see here on uh, our site one, um, we had a yield difference of uh, almost 17 uh, bushels per acre. I guess that's not 17, 20 some bushels per acre. You can see uh, uh, out here on the yield difference, we always find that our moisture is about a point higher with swine manure versus uh, the 28%. I think that a lot of that comes to just a healthier plant with all the micronutrients. On our site two, uh, our results weren't quite as good. Uh, here we had a lot of trouble with uh, sideways movement on the toolbar, uh, the way we had things set up. We were we were plowing out some corn, but at this site in 2018, we had a 17 bushel difference. So how do the numbers look over our uh, six year period of time? Uh, you can see those here. So we've got uh, a six year average 
of about 17, a little over 17 bushel of the acre better with uh, the drag line swine manure over the commercial fertilizer uh, for about a $157 advantage per acre. So we're very comfortable with making the recommendation to go to swine manure as a nitrogen side dress source. Thank you. If you have any questions, make sure that you contact us. Thank you, Sam. The manure side dress trial has always been one of my favorites. So next up, we've got Dr. John Fulton, a professor in the Department of Food, Ag, and Biological Engineering, and he's going to share some results from a nitrogen placement study. Hi, my name is John Fulton. I'm going to be talking about one of the several nitrogen projects reported in the 2019 eFields report. This specific project deals with nitrogen placement during late season. You can find the information regarding this multi-year pro project on pages 52 through 55 of the 2019 report. Uh, for this project, this was conducted in Clark County, Ohio. Our primary intent was to evaluate uh, in placement options and the potential impact they may have on corn yield using a late season application. A uh, little bit of information about the project. We planted somewhere between 33 to 34,000. Uh, these were done in 40 foot plots with the center of those plots harvested, harvested for yield data. You can see weather and other information regarding the site and by year uh, on pages 53 through 55. Our treatments for this were basically four. Our first one was standard practice, again, used at this farm and, and relatively locally. That's 180 pounds of N uh, per acre applied uh, over the season. Uh, for this one, we either did that at planting or planting and side dress as a split application. For our late season treatments, we put 100 pounds of nitrogen on up front, and the balance of that was put on late season at 80 pounds of nitrogen using 28%. Uh, depending on weather and field conditions, we got back in that in the, in the corn somewhere between V14 and the R stage. For the three, three treatments, we did a colder, essentially injected between the rows two to four inches. We did a wide drops or Nutriboss, uh, which essentially is a surface application next to the roots. Uh, the Nutriboss is a New Holland product, but CNH and the wide drops is a uh, 360 yield center product. Uh, our fourth and final one was a center drop or drop tubes, essentially a surface applied between the rows. Here's kind of an example of our setups. The top is uh, treatment two with our colders. Again, a colder with injecting that two to four inches behind that in that slip. The bottom was a, a wide drop example, uh, but at the same time, we used Nutriboss for a couple years on a, uh, during this. Our final one was the center drop or drop tubes. Essentially, we just tied those uh, tubes together, hoses on the Nutriboss or wide drops, and then dribbled that nitrogen uh, down the center of that row. This is kind of an example of what we got. On the left is the drop tube. Again, you can see it dribbled right down the center uh, between the corn rows. The center was colder injected. You can see very clearly that uh, slit opened up and then that nitrogen injected roughly two to four inches. And then on the right side would be the, the results from the neutral balls or wide drop placing that next to the rows. Uh, just some costs provided that we did not provide economics as a part of the analysis of this project. Talking about results, on the left side again, you see our treatments and when that nitrogen was applied. Um, and then in the center part here, we see 16, 17, and 18 yield data, along with the three year running average. Looking at 16, uh, you can see a significant yield advantage uh, in 2016 with the colder or the neutral ball slash Y drop placement. Um, we also saw a significant difference, very similar to basically the same results in 2017, again, where the colder and neutral balls or wide drop gave a yield advantage over the standard practice or center drop. However, when we got to 18, uh, there was no significant yield difference between the, the four treatments. I'd encourage you to learn more about what happened on a year-by-year -year basis, looking at the weather. Uh, information in particular the rain and, and temperatures and also planting date and harvest date to, to understand maybe why some of those differences were seen or did seen like in the year of 2018. Looking at the three-year average uh, when we run the statistics there was no statistical difference between the 
between the four different uh, treatments. However, definitely a trend where the colder and and, uh, and basically placing that next to the roots in a late season uh, provided a yield advantage. Also provided some nitrogen use efficiency numbers on the right side there. Conclusions from this, though there was no statistical difference over the three years between the four treatments, what we did find two of the three years where the colder and the wide dropper nutrient balls provided significant yield response over the standard or the uh, center drop, uh, drop two. 22 bushels and 16 approximately advantage, uh, 15 bushel an acre advantage and 17, and again, none and 18, but definitely a trend that we saw uh, in this project. Thank you. Thanks, John, for sharing those results. Next, we've got Jason Hartshue. He's an extension educator in Crawford County, and he's been taking the lead on our cover crop trials, and he's gonna share what we've learned. I'm Jason Hartshue, OSU Extension Ag and Natural Resources Educator in Crawford County. 2019 provided many unique opportunities and challenges. One of those challenges was the number of acres that were winter killed due to freeze injury of alfalfa. An opportunity that came about due to the amount of prevent plant ground was the opportunity to survey various cover crops to help determine their forage quality and their ability to cover the ground. Through this survey of over 200 different samples, we found that most crops did an excellent job of covering the soil as long as they were planted at a high enough seeding rate. On the other hand, there were some large differences in forage quality and tonnage between these various crops. Summer and annuals, or warm season crops, did the best job at providing the highest dollar return per acre. They weren't always the most nutrient dense crops, but because of the increased tonnage they were able to produce, they returned the highest dollars per acre. Corn led the charge, followed by forage sorghum, sorghum sedan, soybeans, and teff. Some of these corn crops were planted with drills in seven and a half inch rows. Corn was also occasionally let grow all the way to 102 days. Cool season crops and winter annuals did not do quite as well, having lower tonnage and lower dollars per acre. Some of these cool season crops did not even germinate and grow when they were planted in early July, and when planted in late July, they germinated very poorly and did not have a vigorous growth. There were a few mixes in this study, which was very unique and let us look at the opportunities to potentially take some of the cover crop mixes that are on the market and consider to be excellent soil builders and use those for livestock. Maybe not so much for baling, but for grazing. Through this study, we looked at the energy values that different crops produced. The dark green line is the maintenance requirements for an average mid-gestation beef cow in Ohio. Most crops met these energy needs, except for spring triticale, teff, forage sorghum, and peas. These crops were close, but would require supplementation of extra energy in order to maintain our cow herd. Quite a few crops, though, would need some supplementation for a beef cow during lactation. The light green line represents a beef cow's requirements during lactation, while the dark red line is sheep maintenance, and the peach line is sheep lactation. While a lot of these crops fell short at meeting their needs during lactation for both sheep and beef, they're still excellent crops to provide the forage sort of resources that we need for these livestock and can easily be supplemented to meet those energy requirements. Protein was very similar to energy in that most crops met the protein requirements of a beef cow mid-gestation, but even more crops met her needs during lactation and for sheep during maintenance. But quite a few crops would need protein supplementation as represented by the peach line for sheep during lactation. Another study that we conducted looking at these same forage crops but are the exact same management conditions instead of the various conditions based on farmer practices was a study to look at the tonnage and quality at some of our research stations. The crops we looked at, corn, sorghum, teff, soybeans, oats, millet, and peas showed a distinct trend with corn leading the way producing the most tons even when harvested at 60 days of growth. A challenge that we had for some of our producers growing forage oats this year was the amount of crown rust. In order to help manage this, we looked at what would happen if we provided a fungicide treatment to these oats crops. As you can see, the leaf on the right compared to the leaf on the left, the leaf on the right that was treated with fungicide 
had very little disease present. While we didn't see a difference in tonnage from the fungicide treatment, we saw improved quality, which increased the dollar value return per acre to the oats that was treated with fungicide over the untreated. We also found that nitrogen is an important factor when growing oats. When oats was harvested at 45 days, we saw a significant increase in yield by providing 46 pounds of nitrogen compared to no nitrogen at all. We did not really see an increase by providing an additional 46 units for a total of 92 units to the tonnage, but we did see an increase whether that oats was harvested at 45 days or 60 days to providing more nitrogen to increase crude protein. This in turn increased the dollar value return per acre over the cost of that extra nitrogen by making that oats more nutritious. If you want to look at all the different studies that we did and all the different nutritional values of the crops that were in our studies, visit go.osu.edu backslash forage 2019. Great information, Jason. Thank you. Next up, we've got Eric Rieker. He's the extension educator in Fulton County, and he's going to share some of his results from his crimper termination trial. Well, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, I, I'm excited to share just a little bit about the crimper termination trial work that we've been doing in Fulton County really since 2018, but today we'd like to share our 2019 results with you. Before I get started, a couple of our objectives when we think about doing a crimper versus chemical termination trial is, is really, is there an opportunity to reduce um, herbicide use um, mostly with conservation minded farmers and cover crop minded farmers that's trying to remove the residual herbicide to create a better window in the fall. Could also be with the burn down, but mainly residual. Our, our goal is also to increase organic matter and soil resilience over time. Uh, been fortunate to work with two, uh, two collaborators on the equipment side. Uh, the, the prototype of the Ninja crimper is on the right hand side from Martin Equipment and Sons. And um, on the left side is the Smythe Manufacturing uh, crimper, uh, crimper that is handled through Redline Equipment here locally. Um, so the, the protocol was really to compare uh, 40 foot strips of a 2,4-D glyphosate burn down that happened on June 5th. We were hoping that that would happen uh, in May 5th or before, uh, and that would have included a residual in normal years, but didn't in 2019. We compared that against a crimped rye, cereal rye that happened on June 12th, and that probably should have happened closer to June 1st or the 1st to the 5th. We followed up those termination treatments with 15 inch soybeans that were planted on the same day. In fact, they were planted before the crimper trial uh, or the crimped strips so that the product would flow through a, uh, a missized planter, if you will. We didn't have our equipment width sized up exactly. Um, unfortunately, we received two inches of rainfall in the immediate 24 hours after planting. We did use a soybean that was had the extend trait platform that allowed us to spray dicamba and glyphosate post emerge on June 26th. Uh, to gather the harvest data, we used a calibrated Green Star 2 yield monitor, uh, 30 foot strips, and those ended up being harvested on October 19th. So a couple pictures I'll share with you. Uh, this is the picture of the Smythe uh, manufacturing toolbar um, or crimper. Uh, it, in a little bit of what it looks like as it's working and then what it looks like uh, in the screen. Hopefully you can see the rye that's, that's terminated, crimped flat to the ground uh, and generally has, has crimps every six to eight inches in that rye, uh, thereby terminating it mechanically. It should be noted that we waited until after uh, anthesis. You can see a lot of the heads and so that, that rye was uh, in pollination. This is what the strips look like at the at the field site where there were alternating burn down strips with uh, crimped strips. Emergence was uh, generally quite good for the wet conditions that we had. It wasn't perfect. Um, the spacing you can see was not perfect in this picture, but you could find places where it was much better and you could find places that it was worse. As we rolled into harvest, I felt quite uh, quite positive, quite good about the weed control that that uh, the thatch layer created, and then uh, the, the extend product worked quite well too. Uh, the last picture I'll share there, uh, the thatch layer laid flat, 
ran through the combine. Actually, didn't there? There was none of the rye that really ran through the combine. The grain table slid over the the uh, laid down thatch layer quite well. The results in 2019 showed that there was a no no statistical difference in yield between the chemical burn down termination method or the crimper termination method. Uh, numerically, there's a bushel difference there, but uh, the, the LSD of 4.4 bushels uh, helps us see that there was really uh, no statistical difference. Some observations, we will have concerns in years where there are drowned out spots or where maybe the rye didn't get established very well in the fall. So it certainly would encourage guys to establish early with a drill or an air seeder, generally at 80 pounds of cereal rye or more. And again, we wanna work a little bit harder if mother nature allows us to at uh, timing the timing differential. Some future learning and economics, uh, certainly, uh, I think at, at this point we can make an almost apples to apples dollar comparison between a, a herbicide pass versus a, a purchase crimper uh, or custom hiring somebody to do some crimping. Uh, we will continue to learn about that, but we'll also continue to reduce herbicides in this system. We also had a great uh, soil health meeting earlier this week with some producers to get some feedback on how we might possibly measure the soil health and water quality benefits through some sort of uh, metric, standardized metric. We'll continue to move work at moving the, the uh, planting time up two weeks and we know that there's a, a significant amount of grower interest in this practice as we're trying to include some of these trials in the e-fields work. So uh, as you can see, uh, uh, a really healthy picture of beans down in the bottom right hand corner based on a really heavy thatch layer. So it's a fun project. Thanks for listening. Thank you, Eric. And finally, we've got Dr. Stephanie Karhoff and she's going to talk about a fallow syndrome trial, which is something we're planning for the 2020 season. Good morning. My name is Stephanie Karhoff, and I am the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Educator for Williams County. Today, I want to share details about our 2020 fallow syndrome e-fields trial. When fields are left unplanted or fallowed, there may be a decline in beneficial mycorrhizal fungi. This is commonly referred to as fallow syndrome. It is associated with stunting and phosphorus deficiency. This is because mycorrhizal fungi play a key role in fertility by extending the root network via thread-like structures called hyphae. This increases the plant's ability to scavenge for nutrients in the soil. However, the impact of fallow syndrome on yield is unclear and little on-farm research has been done. Due to the high volume of prevented planting acres in 2019, this coming growing season is a rare opportunity to capture data and begin answering questions. Our goal of this trial is to investigate yield impacts and the efficacy of potential recommendations like starter phosphorus or microbial inoculants. We are targeting fields that were not planted in 2019, so no cash crop or cover crop, and will be planted to corn in 2020. Preference is given to fields with soil test phosphorus levels less than 30 or ideally less than 20 parts per million and to ensure that we will not simply be measuring the nitrogen effect from the phosphorus fertilizer, we also prefer fields that can apply 28 or at least some pre-plant or at-plant nitrogen with a blanket application. Required treatments include a control and starter phosphorus fertilizer as either 10340 or MAP through the planter. A potential third treatment would be a microbial inoculant, either targeting mycorrhizal fungi or other strategies to make soil phosphorus more available. The image here is a plot layout example with four replications color coded and three different treatments, the control, starter phosphorus, and an inoculant. OSU Extension will work with farmer cooperators to collect pre-plant soil samples, 
tissue samples at V4 to V6 growth stages, and calibrated yield monitor data. The image here depicts the sampling pattern with it, within each replication and treatment. If you are interested in participating or learning more about this trial, you can either contact myself at this email address or phone number or your local county extension office. Thank you. Thank you everyone. That's the end of our presentations for today, but at this time we would like to take any questions that you've got for any of our speakers or questions about the eFields program in general. Um, remember that you can find the Q&A tab and submit questions through there. Um, it will either be at the top or the bottom of your screen depending on your computer. So the first question we have is for Chris Zoller and the question is, were all the row spacings for the corn seeding rate trials 30 inches? They were, uh, of course, the only one that would be different is the one I explained with the comparing the 15 and 30 inch rows, but all the others were 30 inch, yes. Excellent. And then also for you, Chris, for the seeding rate trials, what were the seed bed conditions for soybeans? Um, were they no-till, conventional, et cetera? I believe they were all no-till, um, certainly maybe minimum till, but I think for the most part, it's hard to remember over the three years, but I'm pretty sure most of it was no-till. For the Tuscarawas counties? For the trial, counties, right. right. I, I'm not sure about the statewide. There's some variability statewide, I know. But. Yeah, for, for both of those questions on the statewide trial, um, there there are some that represent most different tillage conditions, um, some conventional, some no-till, and maybe some minimal till if you flip through. Um, and I think if you go through the booklet each year, it does, you can look at each of the trials and determine whether, which system was used. Correct. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Um, so as you submit any questions that you have, we do have the contact information for our Precision Ag program here on the screen. So be sure to check us out. You can contact us there via email. Um, we're also on Facebook and Twitter. All right, our next question is for you, Stephanie. And the question is about the fallow syndrome trial. Um, there are some products being touted as some supplemental mycorrhizae sources. Is this practical and would it actually make a difference? So great question. And that's one of the reasons why we are doing this trial. There's not a lot of data on some of these products in a scenario where a field was left fallow for an entire growing season and phosphorus might be limited. And if you have a product you're already using or looking at, um, we can add that in as a potential third treatment to the trial. So if you have any fields that were left fallow and are going to corn, depending on what county you're in, we can work on getting you set up for the trial and getting some data on that product. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, another question for you, Stephanie, about the fallow syndrome trial. Are there any other proven proactive approaches that a grower can take to com combat fallow syndrome? And then, you know, this question says in his area, there's a lot of prevent plant acres and they're concerned that they're going to see this a lot, but there's not a lot of soil sampling being conducted currently. So a proactive approach that could have been done this past fall was putting in a cover crop on your prevented planting acres. If you're in a situation where you did not have a cover crop planted and you are concerned about it, you can plant soybean 
rather than corn. So the soybean is less dependent on that mycorrhizal fungi to scavenge for nutrients. I do want to emphasize though, this is a rare issue and there's not a lot of data on it. So that's a large reason why we want to do this trial. Excellent. I know this is one we're very excited about because there are very few opportunities, luckily, that we get to see a phenomenon like this. So this is a great opportunity to collect some data that we might not have been able to collect in other years. So we'll hang around for a few more moments in case some more questions come in. Um, but I do want to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, this has been a wonderful opportunity for us to share. And please don't hesitate to reach out if you have ideas for trials. We, we definitely want the eFields program to be farmer driven. And so for that to happen, we, we need to hear from you about what matters and what, what types of things you would like to see data collected on that can help you make management decisions on your farm. Stephanie, this is Eric. Stephanie, this is Eric in Fulton County. Hey, I can hey. hear you. Walk through those three treatments again on fallow syndrome. So the two required treatments that we have in the protocol, one to control, uh, one would be a starter phosphorus. So that could either be 1034 O or that could be reworked depending on what's um, possible with that grower. And then a third potential treatment would be an inoculant. So one that we are working with right now is with 3-Bar Biologic. And it is not a mycorrhizal product, but it is a product that contains bacteria. And its aim is to increase your solubility and your availability of soil phosphorus. So that's one product that we're working to be available for some of those participating in the trial. Uh, but if they have another product that they're interested in, we can look into that. So, so that would be on top of the 1034O treatment. I mean, that would be 1034O plus uh, the, the biological would be the third treatment. Yes, the biological would be the third treatment. And a check, uh, a check, you're suggesting that the check might be just 28%. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So we've got another question and John, I'm gonna send this your direction. The question is what special projects might we be doing related to field studies for practices in compliance to the H2 Ohio funding incentives? That's a great question. Yeah, yeah, can you hear me okay, Elizabeth? Yep. Yeah, so uh, very good question on that. Uh, besides some of those that you heard today about the cover crops, um, we are so also looking uh, at placement options for fertilizers, uh, both phosphorus and nitrogen. Some of that is, is uh, referenced in the 2019 project. In some of those projects, we're looking at uptake, and so really looking at the efficiency of applied fertilizers within the, the crops here uh, in Ohio. So that would be an additional one. Uh, we continue to, to look at site-specific management strategies. Um, some of these projects um, dealing again with uh, nitrogen and phosphorus or, or conducted in strip trials, but uh, really the intent there is, is to, to drive um, information around variable rate, both uh, nitrogen and phosphorus using some of the data layers that farmers are collecting today. Uh, lastly, just a, a few things beyond, uh, again, we're looking um, at kind of uh, scenarios where we can identify uh, unproductive parts of fields. Uh, and a lot of that deals with doing some profit mapping and looking at uh, potential loss areas that may be even in sensitive areas where we want to convert those acres from actual production over to conservation type structures, buffers, grass waterways and such. So 
a little bit about some of the other things that we're doing, and I think it links well into the, the H2O. Of course, you heard about the manure as well today. We continue to do that, and and Glenn and uh, Glenn Arnold and Sam Custer uh, doing some expansion there. Then it also includes some new technology uh, implementation here in 2020. So. Awesome, thank you, John. Uh, with that, we don't have any more questions coming in, so we will we will wrap up here. Um, I take that back. We have one more question, so we'll we'll answer this. Um, and I'll call out Jason and and John on this one. Either one of you guys can answer this one. If the price of nitrogen is lower this year, will using MRTN cause over application of nitrogen? So with that MRNT, as you know, maximum return to nitrogen, you put in with that the cost of nitrogen and it uses the curve. So just because nitrogen price goes down doesn't mean it will drive application rates up to a point where it's um, environmentally unsound to apply that rate. Um, we know what the response curve is and it'll use a maximum rate part of that equation so that it doesn't put on so much nitrogen even as price goes down. It's a very good model and control to make sure as price goes down, you use a rate that's environmentally and economically sound. And then as price goes up, it really, that economics plays in majorly. You gotta have a pretty good understanding of what your, your future price will be, right? Right, so within that, I mean, <clears throat> when you plug, use that MRNT online tool, it asks you what your price of nitrogen is. Um, and that, you, it also asks for a corn price and you, that's not as important though as what that nitrogen price is for that economic calculation. Excellent guys, thank you. Um, just to wrap up here, thank you again for joining us. The recording of this webinar is going to be available at the same link that you use to register. So if you've got any friends who missed out this morning, go ahead and share and keep an eye out on our social medias for some additional trial summaries that will be coming out in videos over the next few weeks. So thank you everyone. Stay healthy and have a great day.